very much for that introduction. Just trying to get my, uh, my presentation back online. How do we get the, the screen back up? Excellent, good. Yes, thank you for the, uh, the, the invitation and, and being here and, and the warm welcome. It's actually my first time uh, in South Korea and I've really enjoyed it so far. So thank you very much for the warm welcome. Um, I want to talk to you about three things in this, in this hour. Firstly, why science is important for society. Secondly, why we therefore need stronger links between science and the rest of society. And thirdly, what I think we need to change in terms of our mindsets and the way we approach things, if that's to be successful, if, if, if we're to have those stronger links. Um, and the kind of stuff I'll be saying, um, it's still sort of thesis in progress. So I'd be interested in your thoughts and perspectives. I'm going to be talking from what is, uh, I've, I've started my job very recently in terms of looking at public engagement. I'm also very aware that I'm looking at it from a very British and very Western perspective. So I'd, I'd love to know what you think, particularly as I want to go back to the UK on Sunday uh, with real understanding of what lessons that we can learn from how, uh, how science communication works here and what your perspectives on communication are. Um, so before we do all that, just a bit, of, bit more background about myself. Uh, and why I'm standing up here and talking to you. Uh, in my current role, as the introduction said, I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the British Science Association. Uh, and that's an organisation that's existed uh, for a long time in the UK to try and break down the barriers between the public and, uh, and science since its foundation all the way back in 1831. So we're, we're almost 200 years old. Um, in the UK, we're probably best known for putting on the uh, British Science Festival. And that's an annual event which moves around the country. It goes to a different city in the UK every year. Uh, and it's, it's there for the public to come and meet scientists, talk about science, debate scientific issues. Um, so in just over a month, we're going to be uh, kicking off in Newcastle. And next year, we're going to Birmingham. And we're, we're constantly doing new things. And I think I'll be taking back tips from the KAIST organising team about how to put on a successful event, because I've really enjoyed being here. Um, so that meeting's been going on every year, apart from during the World War, since we were founded back in 1831. And for a long time, the meeting that was the British Science Association. We didn't do anything else. It was just this annual meeting, which is a meeting place for the scientists. And it was very much part of this kind of Victorian gentlemanly idea of what science should be about and that all the kind of the eminent scientists of the day would turn up in a different city in the UK, talk to all their friends and colleagues about their research, and then go off and go back to their, their mansions and, and do some more research. And of course, since science has expanded so much, we've now got so many more scientists and so many different more types of science. The festival has changed from being a meeting place just for scientists to one which the aim is to really connect with the public and get the public to come and talk to scientists. Uh, but the association also runs a range of other programmes. So we organise the UK's only national conference for science communication. We provide fellowships for scientists to go work with the media. Uh, and we run the UK's only nationally recognised extracurricular uh, activity system for science activities in schools. So there's all sorts of stuff going on there, and I'll come on to a bit more of it later. But for us, the core principle behind all of our work is that we think it's not just enough for people to be told about science. We think as much as possible need to experience it for themselves and talk to scientists about science in, in a direct fashion. Uh, and as I was saying, I only took over from the, the association a few months ago, and at the moment we're rethinking what our, what our role is and how best to do it. So if you've got any ideas, I'm all ears. Um, before I took over the association, I spent a number of years working on science policy and politics in the UK. And I guess you could characterise that as trying to fight on behalf of science uh, in a political system which doesn't value science very much. Uh, and I don't know if it's different here, but in the UK we have a very hard and frustrating time trying to get politicians to understand why science is important and then doing something about it. And often that's in terms of having the right education policies, um, using scientific evidence and policy making, uh, and of course funding research appropriately, providing the money to make sure that science can happen. And that's been one of the ways in which uh, things haven't gone so well in the past few years. The UK science budget has uh, been falling in real terms um, since the, we, we brought in the post-economic crash budget in 2010 and made all sorts of public sector cuts and science has been one of the areas that we've actually been cutting back on. Um, and I find that really worrying because on the one hand, we're trying to say that science is really important to our national future. Um, it's, you know, it's part of our future economy. On the other hand, we're cutting back investment in science. And I think it's probably no accident that we're, you know, in the UK, we have a system where we have 646 MPs um, and only one of those 646 is a research scientist. Uh, on the other hand, we've got 70 lawyers now, don't get me wrong, I really like lawyers. I know we've got some lawyers here and uh, I think they're really important, but I'm not sure they're 70 times more important than scientists. And for me, that's one of the, the signs that science hasn't properly integrated 
uh, into society, despite of how important we all feel it is. And running through all, all the way through my career, I, I've had a real belief that science is a keystone of modern society. Um, and, you know, so much of our lives rely on science. And, and when I say science, of course, I mean technology, engineering, maths, medicine, social science as well. And I'm sure, I'm, again, I'm preaching to converted here. But it often occurs to me, when we try and imagine a world without science, what we're actually imagining is, is the past. A world without science is one without modern agriculture. It's one without modern medicine, modern transport, modern communications. You know, the, the list goes on. Um, and when you think about it in those terms, it's, yeah, I think it's very true to say that science is a mark of modernity. The modern science is what makes the modern world. And that becomes interesting when you put it in contrast with other bits of culture and society. So if you think about other bits of culture like literature, like religion, like music, you know, even wine, age is no barrier. They, they're equally valuable, sometimes even more valuable when they become older. You know, think about wine and, and literature and, and art in particular. But in science and engineering and medicine, the opposite is true. You know, you wouldn't want a treatment from 100 years ago. You'd want the very, the, the most up-to-date stuff. You want up-to-date technology and science. So I'm not saying that other areas of our culture aren't valuable. You know, in, in fact, the opposite. I think those parts of our culture, like art and music, are they, they make life worth living. But what I'm saying is they rely on science to, make that, to mark their progress and to allow them to progress. Uh, and just to pick an ancient example of this, um, oops, uh, just to pick an ancient example, imagine how the world would look today if it wasn't for uh, the Gutenberg press, you know, invented by Johannes Gutenberg in, in medieval Europe in 1450. Using the press, which he invented, they were able to print the Bible. That Bible was then able to spread worldwide, and that really you know, helped uh, Protestantism take off. And it also challenged uh, Latin's place as a universal language of Europe, because suddenly people were able to you know, dis distribute lots of uh, texts that weren't in Latin, that were in all the other languages of Europe. And that really helped the lang linguistic diversity of Europe, helped the cultural diversity of Europe. And that's obviously had an effect worldwide now, particularly if you look at North and South America. And that's the legacy of this, invent, this engineering invention back in the, in the 15th century. And more recently, we've had the technological innovation of the internet allowing a massive profusion and mixing of art and music to an extent when we just take that for granted now that you can access art and music and it's all mixed together. And every time someone's life is extended, perhaps, you know, say they take drugs like beta blockers or other heart disease therapies, that's more time if they're not dropping dead that they've got to take part in society, whether that's a scientist, whether it's teachers or cleaners or bankers or whatever. There are all these invisible effects that science has on society. And just from the very personal perspective, you know, my own perspective, I, I grew up in Manchester, that's where I was born, and I now live in London. If it wasn't for modern science and modern communications, I wouldn't be able to follow my home team, Manchester United. So personally, for me, it's very important we have these modern uh, technologies. So you could, you could go one step further and say, actually, science and technology are actually, are actually more than just critical to society. Science is what enables society to move forward and evolve. And we see that evolution, that evolution in society, we see it when other forms of culture change when art or music or, or, or food, they change in response to the advances provided by science. But it's the technology and scientific advances that pave the way. Now, this may all be obvious to you. And in fact, it probably is. And I think in some senses, it's too obvious. I think to people like us who grew up in the world of science, that, kind of, that importance of science becomes so obvious that we forget that science still needs to be a part of society and not set apart from it. It still needs to be a part of culture and recognised as a fundamentally human activity. Um, and not somehow set aside from everything else in our culture. Um, and I think, to be fair, part of the reason it's so tempting to take the view of science as a bit separate is that science is actually quite different from everything else we do. If you think of things like music and art and sport and language, most of the other elements of our culture, they've been around ever since we've been around as a species. We've been doing those ever since you know, we, we, we were descended from the apes. Um, but modern science is actually very new. I mean, yes, we can trace our intellectual heritage of science back to people like Galileo and Copernicus and, and Archimedes, but actually those people wouldn't have thought of themselves as scientists. And if we went and looked at what they did, it wouldn't really look like modern science. Um, and, we, and it wouldn't be the scientific method they were using. And in fact, the word science itself, that wasn't used until the early 19th century. It's actually a very, very new concept that there's a particular class of people called scientists. Um, I heard of a story that actually the word scientist was first used at one of the early meetings of the British Science Association. I'm still trying to, to verify that, but it's an interesting story if it's true. But of course, once modern science and the modern scientific method did take, uh, did take a foothold, the pace, has been, uh, you know, the pace of change has been un unbelievable. Um, we've had the, the, the acceptance and the spread of the scientific method. And when I talk about the, method, the scientific method, I'm, I'm referring to the principles of falsifiability, of detached observation, and the rest of 
that whole method that makes science so unique as a human activity. And if you think about it, the reason we have those principles of detachment, of, of falsifiability, is because we recognise that we, as human beings, are biased. You know, we find it difficult to look at phenomena, at data and evidence objectively. So we've come up with this scientific method to, to give us a kind of a deliberately unhuman uh, method to, which guards against our own human frailties. So for instance, we are, as humans, very prone to spotting patterns in everything. We can't help it. That's not a face, but when you look at it, you see a face. Um, that's not a face, but when you look at it, you see a face. It's, it's, there's, there's something intrinsic. There's something intrinsic in our brains, which means we always spot patterns, even when they're not there. So that's why, in the scientific method, you've got high standards of statistical significance. So you can't just spot patterns and say, oh, there, there must be a link there. You've got to actually have the data to prove it. And whereas people are individualistic in how we do you know, many of our actions, the scientific method relies on peer review to make sure that we actually get consensus on what and what's important. And where people like you and I, we often get bored by monotony, the scientific method relies on the fact that we need repeated experiments and observations. And whereas we find it very easy to uh, just believe what our, what our eyes tell us, you know, if our eyes are telling us one thing, we find it hard not to believe them. The scientific method forces us to rely on our objective data rather than just our own senses, because we know our senses can fool us into seeing something that isn't there. Again, these are the things that make science so successful. They enable us as a species to reach beyond our human limits and, and achieve you know, amazing feats of ingenuity. But, uh, I'm sorry, that they also make science a great international unifier of people. Some engineering above our heads as well. <laughs> And I, and I say that they, um, you know, science is a great unifier of people because you know, one plus one is two, whether you're a socialist, you're a capitalist, you're a libertarian. The laws of genetics apply whether you're a communist or a fascist or an anarchist. You know, being an atheist doesn't make evolution any more or any less true. And aeroplanes are still held in the, the sky by physics, not by belief. All those things are dependent on you know, the universal acceptance of scientific principles, not about personal beliefs. But that alienness, that inhumanness of the scientific method I was talking about, the fact that it doesn't come naturally to people, and the way that science is presented as something that's without values, without dogma, independent, um, that can create problems when you try and integrate science with the rest of society, and when we're trying to get members of the public who don't see themselves as scientists to engage with scientific issues. Because um, everything else in society, it does have bias, it does have values, and it usually isn't detached and it usually isn't independent. It's got all these sorts of context and baggage that comes with it. And sure, for, so for those people like ourselves, science is an international unifier. You know, we've all come here from different countries and we're all talking about science. And for us it's unified, but for people outside science and outside the scientific community, those scientific principles can be seen as very exclusive. They can, they can act as a way to stop people looking in and act as a barrier. And the danger is that for those people, science becomes seen as something that other people do that they don't have access to. If you think about it, everyone in society, they can appreciate the arts, sport, culture. And although that we all still use the products of science and engineering, the actual practice and process of research, that becomes hidden to view and it becomes available to only a select few people, people like you and me, essentially. Um, this is a chap called C.P. Snow, and he was an English chemist back in, um, uh, back in the last century. And he delivered a famous lecture in 1959 called The Two Cultures. Uh, and in that lecture, uh, Snow argued that scientists and people for humanities were essentially basically living in two separate societies. And he pointed out that an intelligent person, they wouldn't be able to, you know, they wouldn't dream of saying something like, I don't like literature or, you know, Shakespeare isn't for me. But for the same person, you know, they might easily say, oh, I don't get maths or they don't know what Newton's laws of thermodynamics are. Even though really those, those should be as an important part of our culture as, as Shakespeare literature. Uh, and today in England, and indeed you know, elsewhere in, in Europe and the West, and, and probably even worldwide, we still talk about the two cultures. We still talk about that divide between humanities and science. Um, and I think there's an asymmetry, because for most people, unless you studied science at university or you know, any other science degree, um, science is pretty much a closed book for you for the rest of your life. You know, we've talked about the challenges earlier in, in the day of how do you get people from outside the world of science to engage with science. Um, and it's really difficult unless you've had that training in, in research. Whereas for us as scientists, we find it very easy to access sports or culture or, or art or history. So that there really is an asymmetry, I, I believe, that's still there. And I think that divide, that asymmetry, it creates problems for us as a scientific community, and it creates problems for society in general as well. And some of the social problems uh, are obvious. 
we talked a bit about this earlier in the day in, uh, in, in Maya's talk. The UK, like actually many European countries, has effectively banned uh, genetically modified crops, uh, GM crops. And that's because there's still huge hostility to GM technologies in Europe. And just last year, you know, there's, there's barely months ago now in the UK, we had people who were trying to rip up crops uh, as part of a field trial uh, because they objected to the technology and they thought it was uh, unsafe. Uh, and yes, part of the problem with, with GM is people are very suspicious of the motives behind the companies and the organisations who are trying to, to push the technology. But um, I think the bigger part of it is people just still don't believe it's safe. They're, they're worried about the technology. They don't, they don't want to use it because they don't think it's safe. And that's actually despite a huge amount of evidence, scientific evidence showing that GM food generally is safe. So if there's all that evidence, why do people not believe it? I think if you talk to a lot of scientists, they might tell you that, well, that's just the public being stupid. You know, they don't want to believe, they're just, they're just, they don't care about the evidence, they're being stupid. But I think normally you'll find, by and large, people are relatively intelligent. Um, so I don't think that argument about the people being stupid and not understanding, or not being able to understand, really flies. And if you think about it, if you don't have enough information about a particular technology and understanding about that technology to decide whether it's safe or not, and if that's basically because you've been excluded from the scientific process for the reasons we've just talked about, you're actually making the smart and rational choice by saying, hang on, there's something I don't understand, I'm not going to take the risk. That's the smart and clever thing to do in that situation. So effectively, we've got a situation where because people don't understand how the scientific process works and because they don't have enough engagement with science to know what's really going on with GM and whether it's safe or not, they take the safe option, assume there's a risk, and now I've got a situation where because of that lack of engagement, research and progress on GM and acceptance of GM is being held back. And admittedly, this kind of attitude is sometimes can lead to quite entertaining outcomes. So you, you'll have picked that my presentation style is basically a series of photos. I don't really have a, uh, a slideshow as such. Um, this is a sign that was put up in Kentucky uh, recently. And it's a warning by someone uh, to say, stop jumping in the water fountain. Except they thought that if they just said, don't jump in the water fountain, people would do it anyway. So they've tried to make it sound scary by saying water contains high levels of hydrogen, which of course, you know, it's two thirds hydrogen. And there's actually an entire Wikipedia page devoted to this kind of stuff. And one of my favorites from this is uh, just a few years ago, I think it was 2008 or 2009, there was an MP in New Zealand um, who went into her parliament and said, um, you know, there's this substance, this drug called dihydrogen monoxide. Uh, can it be banned because it's clearly so dangerous? Uh, and <laughs> that's quite funny because, you know, it's, it's, it's water. But think for a moment what it says about the divide between science and society, that just by calling a substance like water dihydrogen monoxide, that suddenly makes it seem so sciencey and so scary that parliamentarians, you know, the elites of, you know, Western uh, and, and civilised society, they want to ban it. You know, these aren't just one-offs. There's an entire, there's, you know, every year, pretty much, there's, there's examples of this kind of stuff happening, of, uh, of this, this particular joke cropping up again and again. And that same phenomenon, that the public disengages science, sees science as scary and not part of society. It can have funny consequences, but it can have tragic consequences as well. And the, the one I want to raise in particular is, um, is back in the 1990s, there was a big scare in the UK over a government-issued vaccine uh, for, three, for three diseases, measles, mumps, and rubella. And the vaccine protected kids against all three of those diseases, and it was called the MMR jab, so MMR for measles, mumps, and rubella. And there was some, um, some particularly vicious scaremongering by uh, a, 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 a doctor who was lately found to be doing unethical experiments. And he started a rumour saying that if you get the MMR vaccine for your kids, your kids might develop autism. Uh, and it'll be unsurprising to learn that once that rumour spread, vaccination rates for those diseases really fell through the floor. People stopped vaccinating their kids. Uh, and of course, it doesn't take much, uh, much of a drop in, in vaccination rates to really harm herd immunity. And a huge number of children are put at risk of these devastating diseases when there's no real evidence that there's any link with autism at all. And this graph, for me, this is a graph which shows uh, the yellow bars are MMR uptake, so that's the, the percentage of the population, uh, target population, that's taking the, the vaccine. And the blue line is the cases of measles. And you can see just around the, um, the kind of the early 2000s, um, the vaccination rates were relatively low. And measles cases rates went from almost nothing to a real spike because of that drop in vaccination. And again, that, that for me is a graph of, of children falling ill and dying because society isn't well enough engaged 
with science technology to make a judgment on whether that vaccine is safe or not. And it comes back to that point. These aren't people making stupid decisions. They're saying there's risk here. I don't understand the risk because I don't have enough understand, you know, I don't have enough engagement to process this properly. I'm going to take the safe option and not give my child a vaccine. And maybe would it have been different if everyone had a either an appreciation or knowledge that they could get an appreciation of how vaccines work? Would it have been as bad? I'd like to think so. I mean, I don't know, but, I, but that would be my guess, that it would have been better. And of course, vaccines rates have recovered, but it, it really illustrated how, what, what the danger of lack of scientific engagement can be. So there's another way we can look at um, whether the public are being disenfranchised and disengaged with science. And that's by asking, is science answering the questions and giving the solutions to people? And you know, people as taxpayers are the ones that are funding it. Are they giving the solutions and answers that people want? Or perhaps a different way to ask, to ask the same question. Do we instead have an assumption that science is so complicated that any discussions and decisions based around science are best left to scientists themselves, people like you and me? And sometimes I worry that scientists have a very linear view of discovery. We assume that we started knowing nothing. Um, you know, we'll do more science, spend more on science, and we'll discover more. And that there's a straight line of technology to stretching back from you know, the wheel and fire somewhere over there, so kind of the cure for cancer in the space elevator somewhere over there. And we just need to kind of turn, you know, turn the wheel of science enough and we'll, we'll, we'll discover it all. Um, but in fact, of course, in, in the finite world we live in, science and technology aren't that straightforward. We actually have to make choices about what we want to discover and therefore what we don't want to spend time on. And to give a very kind of parochial and straightforward example, uh, just from industry a few years ago, some of you might remember there was, there was kind of a big industrial battle over what should be the successor technology to DVDs. And throughout the mid-2000s, you had companies like Toshiba and Sanyo who were backing uh, HD DVD, and others such as Sony and Samsung that were backing Blu-ray, and in the end, Blu-ray won. And now, even though HD DVD was a superior technology, it actually gave a clearer picture, we ended up with Blu-ray instead. So that's an example of how you can have two technologies and make a decision about which one you want to go down, and that's a choice you make. It's not just a, a kind of a, a linear, straightforward thing. There are choices involved. And that same sort of debate is happening all across the world right now when it comes to renewable technologies for, for energy. You know, governments and companies and, and organisations deciding, you know, do they want to, they've got limited funds, do they want to spend money on wind energy, wave energy, solar, nuclear, biofuel? Uh, those, those are all real and current questions because there's a feeling that we can't do them all. So rather than a straight line, I think it's better to think of science as a kind of a branching tree. And in the case we just discussed, that was, you know, Blu-ray, the brand, that Blu-ray branch has flourished and the HD DVD branch has, has withered. Um, and, and there are choices to be made. And a more crude, but I think more arresting uh, way of thinking about the same thing is about how do we make choices about our global health agenda? Um, today, the world spends less money on research treatments for malaria, researching treatments for malaria, than it does on researching treatments for male pattern baldness. So I think that says something quite interesting about the way in which our international research funding goes. I mean, maybe I'll feel different when I start to lose my hair. But I, <laughs> but I think at the moment that's, that's, a, really, that's a really bizarre thing. It's, and, and again, we not, might not be aware that's a choice we're making, but we are making that choice not to emphasise research into tropical diseases. Um, how, how different would society look? You know, this might be an example of how society might look if uh, the public, if we as scientists, spent more time thinking and deciding about what sorts of research we should do. Um, and the, thing, the point I'd like to emphasise is that our current set of technologies, they're not the only set that's possible. We have them because of the research we chose to do in the past, and the technology we have in the future will be the result of research that you and I are choosing to do now. And I argue that we, if we want to really involve the public in this process, we need to find a way of helping them make those sorts of decisions. And those of you here for, for Maya's talk this morning will have heard lots of examples where we can help the public talk to us and make those decisions. Um, but the question I like to ask is not how to do it, but why we should do it. What's wrong with the status quo? Well, for a start, I think if we involve the public more, we'd actually get more science. We'd have more funding for research. I, I don't know how, what the situation is in, in, in this country at the moment, but in the UK, we are kind of locked in a constant battle with the government to say they should provide more funding for research because it's an investment in the country's future. And that argument is never simple because the debates tend to be focused on economics and in economics, unlike in science, you never really get a kind of silver bullet. There's no single argument you can deploy saying actually that's the correct answer. It's always a matter of degrees. 
So I always wish, when I was, you know, I was working in the, in the science policy sphere, that the public themselves would, try, would help us demand more support for science because they saw it as responding to their own concerns. And at the moment, I don't think that's true. That it's not responding to their concerns. It's kind of done by scientists to them. And if working in politics taught me one thing, it's that if politicians respond to anything, they respond to the need to get votes to get re-elected. Uh, but right now, science tends to be low on voters' list of priorities because they don't have a strong stake in it. Um, and we're going to need more worldwide support, worldwide support for research to face up to issues like climate change, solve issues in you know, medicine and healthcare, feed an ever-growing population. These, these are all challenges which we need public funding of research for. But at the moment, we don't have public support for in a, in a meaningful, engaged way. And again, I'm arguing that we will all stand to benefit if we, if we include the public in that process. But even if that doesn't happen, and I'm just being naive that the public will, will kind of support science more if they engage with it more, I still think scientists have a duty and an, op and an opportunity to engage the science, team, particularly those who are publicly funded. Again, if it's taxpayers who pay for your work, taxpayers who are, who are funding your, your research, it's your responsibility to tell them about your work. And actually, sometimes that can help your work as well. And I'd like to give uh, one example of this. And this is a kind of a fairly infamous case in the UK. And it's a, it's a, it's a story of how a group of sheep farmers were ignored by scientists. Um, and you probably know that back in 1986, the, power, the nuclear power plant at Chernobyl uh, underwent a massive uh, uh, meltdown, and it's the, you know, it's the, it's the most catastrophic nuclear um, uh, accident we've ever had in the world. And uh, some of the consequences that we had um, radioactive rain over northern Europe, including in the UK, and particularly in the northwest of England in a place called Cumbria, which is where this is. But I don't know how you tell it's in Cumbria. There aren't really any landmarks. I don't think that sheep's there all the time. Um, particularly in Cumbria, because of the local soil composition, um, a lot of the radioactivity stayed in the soil. Um, and after the disaster, after, after Chernobyl exploded, the government sent a team of scientists up into Cumbria to look at the soil around there and, found that, and the scientists found that the soil had become so radioactive that it meant that the, the farmers were effectively banned from doing anything with their sheep. They couldn't actually farm on the land anymore. And as you can imagine, this had devastating consequences for the farmers in question, but also for the local economy. Uh, but years later, uh, there was another team of scientists that went in and the second team of scientists spent a long time talking to the farmers in question. And it turned out that given that the farmers had lived their entire lives in the local area, they had a really uh, in-depth and good knowledge of what the local water drainage systems were like, what the soil systems were like. And the scientists used that knowledge with their own expertise to find that actually the initial assessment was wrong and they were able to change the regulations around what the, um, what the farmers were able to do. And th but this took years and years and years. So needless to say, the farmers didn't come away with, from the experience with, a, with an, uh, a feeling that the scientists were on their side. They felt that the scientists had just ignored them. And the scientists probably didn't intend to be arrogant, but because they assumed that their scientific knowledge trumped the farmers' local knowledge of what the local area is like, they didn't need to, to engage with them, and, and obviously they were wrong, and actually their research suffered as, suffered as a result. They got the wrong result in their research. So the lesson from that, I think, is that especially when your work is actually going to directly and material effect, materially affect members of society, it, it makes a lot of sense to talk to them and to have it in the back of your mind that if your work is affecting the public, you should engage with them before, during, and, and, and when you do your research. And actually, so much of science falls into that category. You know, how, how, how many bits of science can we think of where the public aren't involved at all? It's, it's vanishingly small. Um, so you may well get better uh, res results from your work, but you almost definitely have a better public perception of, of what you're trying to do. And again, there's a huge number of ways to, to do those types of engagement. Um, where, so I'm not going to spend a, a lot of time focusing on the particular methods. But what I want to talk about is, is the mindsets behind why we do that and how we do that. The, you know, how do we respond to the question, how do we make science accessible to, to non-experts? How do we need to approach that problem? And for me, the answer to that question really revolves around showing the human side of research. And I was spending a long time kind of laboring the point that the scientific method is kind of inherently alien and inhuman, and it's designed to be that way because it needs to get around our, help us get around our human biases so we can achieve independent and objective results. And that, perhaps that's what causes the kind of divide between science and the rest of society. But it's important to remember that the scientific method isn't the be-all and end-all of science, because actually you, scientists themselves, are the other big factor in the equation. And all the scientific method is independent and valueless and without dogma. You are not. You, know, you come to the, your science and your research with your own set of motivations, your own set of ideas. So we need the, the scientific method to remain independent and objective, but that doesn't mean that scientists themselves need to you know, think of themselves as robots 
uh, and not have any kind of emotions when they come to their research. We need to remember that there is values to what you're doing and that science is a fundamentally human enterprise. You know, humans can do science, robots can't. It requires creativity, it requires, it requires thoughts. And I think if we can talk about that human motivation, talk about why you're doing the research that you're doing, that's what's really going to help the public understand and engage with the, with the entire process. But at the moment, I feel that, I mean, this, this is not a kind of a universal description, but often rather than try and shine that light and, and show the human side of research, we actually try and hide it. We try and pretend that science is a kind of uh, a robotic enterprise and we just discover one thing after another and, and human motivation doesn't really have any part to play. Um, but of course, the truth is that most scientists do the research they do because they're passionate about the field they're in. So what, why don't we talk about it more? Are we, are we perhaps worried that if we show the public for, that scientists for what they really are, that they're actually you know, relatively normal people with, with normal lives and norm, normal ideas, that the public would have less respect for science? Is, is that what we're worried about? Um, if that's the case, I've, I've got a few examples which I think will, will prove the opposite. The first one is to talk about this man. Um, this is uh, Norman Borlaug, and he was uh, a great scientist who sadly died a few years ago. But he's regarded as the, the father of the agricultural green revolution, um, and that was a scientific movement which, which, you know, undoubtedly changed the world. His innovations in plant science are credited with saving the lives of over a billion people, uh, and he, he actually won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1970. And for me, he's the perfect example of someone who did use a scientific method, kept the scientific method uh, in, in, you know, as what it's meant to be in terms of being objective and, and, and independent and, and, false, and using the principles of falsifi falsifiability in his research. But he was unashamed in saying that the reason he's using science is to serve his own convictions and his own beliefs. And he, he said famously that um, without food, man can live at most but a few weeks. So without it, all of the components of social justice are meaningless and that food is a moral right of all who are born into this world. So in other words, he wasn't entertaining a kind of public myth that science is kind of nature sitting there like an open book and the job of scientists to come along and read that book. He was saying that he wants to, you know, he sees injustice in the world and he wants to do something to, ch to change it and he's going to use the scientific method to do so. And I think the fact that he's open about his motivations and very clear about why he's doing things and his passion doesn't just stem from curiosity but it stems from a real desire to see a change in the world. And that's to his credit and I think it helps science as well. So that model of communicating the reasons and the motivations and the context behind research and not just the research itself is one I actually wish more scientists would adopt. I mean, of course, we can't all save a billion lives. We can't all have the high and lofty ambitions of, of Borlaug. And maybe sometimes our ambitions won't be as interesting and as important to other people. But I still think we should share them and let people see science for the human process that it really is. Uh, but even if you can't do that, or even if you think that's not relevant to you, I think there are other kind of slightly more down-to-earth ways that we can publicise the human side of science. And one of my favourite uh, recent examples of this uh, in practice was a, was a hashtag on Twitter called uh, Overly Honest Methods. I don't know if any of you have seen this. Uh, but I, th I think it's particularly funny because um, it, it, it gave the lie to, um, to uh, what happens when you write up a scientific paper. So this is the kind of stuff that scientists are putting up. Um, this scientist tweeted that you know, the reason he chose the reagent was it became unavailable in 2002 because nobody wanted to order more and risk being added to terrorist watch lists. Um, <laughs> another person said that the polymerase chain reaction is repeated for 25 cycles because that's how long it takes to go and teach a class. <laughs> and of course, actually, when you write up an experiment and, and publish a paper, that's the kind of, it's actually, you're, you're engaging in a bit of fabrication. You're, you're covering up everything that doesn't conform to the neat and tidy view of science, uh, uh, because that's the view of science we all want to portray, that there's no kind of, uh, there's no kind of problems and there's, and there's no confusion and there's no uh, intricacies to what we're doing. It's, it's all a kind of a, a neat process. Um, so I thought this kind of spontaneous revolt against that uh, conformity was really refreshing to see. And maybe some of these examples wouldn't make a lot of sense to members of the public. But th I think that spirit is showing, to be, showing science to be the interesting human enterprise and, do and doing so in public is really valuable. And for me, I think the important thing is that we're seeing that the problems of, of challenge, in, in this case, we're seeing the problems and challenges of research are unavoidable and they're actually integral to the process of science and it's humans that solve those problems. Uh, my next example is kind of on a similar note, but it's back on a slightly more grand scale. Um, this is a picture of a neutrino detector. Um, and you probably know that neutrinos are tiny particles with almost no mass whatsoever. 
and they're so massless that they barely interact with any other matter at all. So if you're trying to detect them, you need something very, very big, and, the, and the, this is what you use. Um, and you might, you might know this story. The Large Hadron Collider over in CERN in Geneva generates neutrons, neutrinos in, in large quantities, and from there, some of them travel to uh, a detector. I'm not actually sure if it's this one or not, but a neutrino detector in Gran Sasso in northern Italy. And that uh, detector actually picks up these neutrinos as part of a long-running experiment called, uh, called OPERA. So you have the neutrinos being generated over in the top left in Geneva, yeah, the Al Large Hadron Collider, and then travelling all the way to, uh, to Gran Sasso in Italy. And back in 2011, the researchers at Gran Sasso uh, caused a bit of a stir because they did some number crunching, looked at the distances, looked at the time, and thought that they had found that the neutrinos were actually coming to them from CERN faster than the speed of light, which is, of course, impossible because nothing travels in the fast, faster than the speed of light, which is what Einstein tells us. But that's what the data were showing. So they scratched their heads, they redid their sums, they asked around, and they couldn't find an explanation for why they were getting this, this, these results. So they were actually forced to publish the paper saying, we've discovered neutrinos faster, traveling faster than the speed of light. And as you can imagine, it led to a huge amount of media and public interest, because all of a sudden you had all these headlines saying, was Einstein wrong? Is time travel now possible? If neutrinos can go fast in the speed of light, can we go fast in the speed of light? You know, there's all, it kind of opened a huge can of worms about what might be possible if we overturned Einstein's theories. Uh, and people loved it. People were really asking all sorts of questions about what this might mean for particle physics. Um, and of course, the scientists, the particle physicists who were responding and, and commenting this on the media, they didn't know the answer either. They'd seen the original paper. They had their own ideas about what might be likely. But no one knew the answer. And he had this weird period of a few weeks where there were all sorts of theories being put out, out and about. And of course, eventually what they found was that uh, it was a mixture of faulty wiring and incorrect al calculations, uh, which meant the data was incorrect and Einstein was correct after all, and the neutrinos were travelling at normal neutrino speed and they weren't going fast in the speed of light. Uh, but in the intervening time, there was a real kind of excitement and, and, and interest in what this might mean for science. But actually, I think that picture of science, one where you get a weird result, you go and scratch your head, perhaps call your colleagues, perhaps figure it out, that's actually closer to what science actually looks like than the sanitised view we normally get in the media. Because normally, you know, you see a research paper get published, journalists write about it, X person comments on it, Y person comments on it, and you get this, you know, clean, neat breakthrough presented. I think the experience of Grand Sesso is actually what happens behind the scenes all the time. I mean, granted, not every experiment might disprove Einstein, but I think the Grand Sesso experiment really showed that engaging the public with unfinished research and complicated work can be really successful and get them excited in a way that just presenting clean data might not, might not do. Um, and a, th a third, third example about this uh, same point, again focusing on the UK, um, in 2009, during the run-up to the Copenhagen uh, Climate Summit on climate change, um, the servers of the climate research units um, at the University of East Anglia uh, in England were hacked into, and it led to something called, uh, called Climate Gates, because the hackers managed to download huge quantities of data from these scientist servers, um, and what they found were lots of emails between scientists, uh, basically discussing their research methods, figuring how to present their data, and to be honest, it probably didn't leave the scientists in the best light. So, you know, if you think about the number of emails you send and, uh, and, how, and what from those emails might get misquoted, there was real potential for things to be presented quite badly. So, for instance, some of the quotes that were attributed to the scientists were saying things like, um, you know, can we use a trick to make the data fit? And perhaps, are, you know, are we not able to uh, account for the lack of warming when we're talking about climate change? And obviously, climate sceptics jumped on this straight away. They thought that this was proof that climate science had been making the entire thing up all along. And a subsequent investigation, this is some of the media coverage that happened in the US, you know, uh, commentators saying that this was game over or, or a game changer for the climate science movement. And a, a subsequent investigation showed the climate scientists had done nothing wrong. They did their research entirely above board. But before that happened, you had weeks and, and probably months of media coverage, uh, which all suggested that climate change was fundamentally flawed and that scientists were, were, were all making it up. And actually, that overshadowed many of the talks that were happening in, Co in Copenhagen on climate change. So researchers worried that the uh, climate science had kind of been dealt a fatal blow. The public would now think that scientists routinely lied and cheated. Um, and again, the context is that usually the public don't get to see those kind of discussions. All they get to see is the end product. Um, so when, you know, we're worried that when you present those, uh, those conversations, the public will just not like it and not want to see that. But actually, 
there were some opinion polls done later, kind of a year later, and it became clear that most of the people who changed their mind about climate science after the Climate Gate Affair, they actually became more convinced that global warming was a scientific fact, not less. And Michael Brooks, who's, a, who's an author, he wrote a book called Free Radicals, and he was writing about this, and, he, and he's, he commented that people who were unsure about whether to trust scientists got a glimpse of scientists being human and thought that was okay. Contrary to everything scientists might have feared, exposing, exposing their irrationality, their humanity, and even their hot tempers makes the public more receptive to the revelations of science, not less. So in other words, there's absolutely no reason to go out there and actually talk to the public about what the practice, process, and motivations are behind science. Before I finish, there's one, thing, one last thing I'd like to focus on. Uh, and so far I've talked about uh, how we create conversations between scientists and non-scientists. And the last thing I'd like to focus on is how do we actually get non-scientists to do science? Because I think that's uh, an even better way to get people to understand the scientific process. And there's, there's two main routes to this which I think we can focus on. One of them is, um, is citizen science, which I know that w was brought up earlier today. And at the moment, it's kind of a vague and but slightly exciting area. And so at the moment, citizen science is used to refer to a huge range of things. And on the one hand, you've got things like SETI at home, which I don't know if you've played with. It's basically a way for you to download uh, data on your computer, and your computer crunches information about whether there might be aliens transmitting signals to us. And all you're contributing is, is your own computer time, basically. Uh, and then you've got things like Galaxy Zoo. Uh, and Galaxy Zoo is an experiment which gets members of the data to actually help analyse scientific data. And in this case, they're, um, they're working to help classify galaxies into different shapes. We had a quick conversation about how do, you, how, you know, well, how do you explain what a galaxy is to the members of the public. In this situation, you've got members of the public helping you characterise different types of galaxies into, into different uh, areas. And this is then used as part of a, a scientific write-up. And at the other extreme, you've then got some examples of co-creation of scientific experiments between members of the public and scientists. And that's often particularly when they're trying to address local and environmental challenges. They actually talk to each other and figure out what are the problems they want to address and how they address it together. And the other example that I want to finish on finally, which is, I think, even more important than we, and we actually spoke about in the last session up here in the panel discussion, is about how science is taught in schools. And this is where I make the slightly embarrassing admission, which some of you may be able to identify with, that I found science actually quite boring at school until I was 16 or 17. And I think I really enjoyed thinking about science, but I always found the practicals and the experiments are really dull. And it always seems to be that the way that you do experiments and do practicals is you get taught about a certain principle, you know, whether it's osmosis or whether it's Newton's laws. And the teacher will then show you how to demonstrate this principle and get you to repeat the experiments. And because school kids aren't trained scientists, we usually we'd get the experiment horribly wrong. You know, we'd get the wrong results, we'd do it wrongly, and then you know, we'd have all this mess. And then at the end, you write it up in the correct way anyway. You know what result you're meant to get, so you write up the results the way you're meant to do it. And you write up what was meant to happen rather than what actually happened. And of course, I'll say something obvious, that's not science. It's following a recipe, it's, following, it's repeating someone else's work, whereas science involves coming up with your own questions, being curious yourself and figuring out how to answer those questions. And again, if you do art or drama or music, you actually need to perform or act uh, or produce music in order to, to do those subjects. But when you study science, you don't actually do any real science until you get to the kind of age that you, know, that you or, or we all are now, the, the middle or the end of your bachelor's programme. Until then, you're just following instructions. You're not actually doing science. And I think if we could change that, if we can make it so that everyone who studies science at school gets a real appreciation of the, of the creativity, the excitement, of the, kind of the voyage into the unknown, to the heart of science, I think that would probably do more than anything else we could do to change public engagement with science. It would change the way society looks at risk, looks at technological progress, and would reverse the problem that I talked about earlier, that members of the public often think that science is something that other people do, but it's not for them. So that's been a kind of quick ramshackle tour through my current thinking on public engagement with science and what needs to change within it and how science needs to improve. And it's not a set of instructions to you. I think it's more of a set of challenges to us all as a scientific community and to you in particular as, as young scientists, to ask yourself, how do you want your community, your scientific community, to be perceived out there in the wider public? Because the way in which you pursue your careers, the way in which you communicate your research, that's going to be completely critical and vital. That will, and how you communicate your motivations, that will shape the future of both the science you do and the relationship that science has with society. Thank you.